So uh, I wanted the, the talk to be uh, uh, quite open so that uh, it's not going to be extremely technical, but we're going to talk about random matrices. And so the, the title is a bit uh, provocative, and, and hopefully the answer is yes, uh, which would mean that uh, in the future, if you guys are interested into machine learning, uh, and, and this is where the money is now, or in artificial intelligence, let's say, then uh, since you know random matrices, uh, this is a perfect fit. So let me just uh, give you uh, in a few pictures what uh, we are doing in my in my group uh, and uh, what I believe uh, why I believe that random matrices are so important to uh, to machine learning and artificial intelligence in the future. So um, wh wh when you deal with the problem of machine learning, you have access to a bunch of data that are uh, typically quite quite numerous. So you have uh, for me it's going to be n. The number of data is going to be large. And they are of super large dimensions, so that's going to be p in the rest of the p in the rest of the talk. So you have uh, naturally large dimensional matrices, which are the matrices collecting all of the data. Uh, what you do with the, well, the problem you have in machine learning that you don't have in other disciplines is that those data they tend to be extremely structured in such a way that we cannot well people don't believe that you can model the data easily. So uh, when it comes to um, uh, inferring things like uh, doing classification, regression, etc., on data, you develop you tend people tend to develop algorithms that are uh, often based on heuristics, uh, in the sense that uh, well the algorithm they will work, but but you don't really know what will be their performances, why they actually work, and uh, well you just uh, develop the, the method and you hope for the best. Uh, those algorithms, that's going to be super important, and that's another feature of uh, machine learning, is that those algorithms, they are intrinsically uh, using nonlinear functions. And the reason why they use nonlinear functions is to be capable to unwrap the, the, the complexity inside the data. So the, the data are, are complex, uh, quite structured, and you want with nonlinear functions to, 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 to linearize things so that you can start to do classification and classical uh, operations on them. So in practice, in, in uh, let's say computer science, you develop those machines. Uh, it can be uh, uh, support vector machines. It can be uh, neural networks, deep neural networks. And at the end of the day, if you want to do classification in here, you see that it works. I, I see a, a collection of all of my cars, a collection of all of my birds, and the other one are planes. Uh, it works. But the problem is that uh, well, you have no clue about the performances. Does it work efficiently? Uh, is it is it performing well, uh, close to the optimal or whatever? This we don't know. In particular, in terms of uh, what happens today, uh, when you use deep learning algorithms, uh, those are uh, huge machines that, that by the way, uh, are not uh, very friendly with the environment. Uh, and uh, and that do a decent job, but uh, you don't know if you could have done the same thing for less and if you can do even better. So as mathematicians, uh, we tend to uh, forget about all, all of this and to say that the data, well, I cannot play with them directly. So let's assume they are just uh, large dimensional Gaussian vectors. Okay, that's uh, pretty convenient or, or, or whatever uh, easy distribution of data. So uh, let's say those things are just Gaussian uh, mixture models. The, the problem that still lies in understanding how the algorithm works for, for those um, easy models is that, again, the algorithms are nonlinear. Well, it turns out, and I will show you this today, that when you use random matrix theory and, and, and other methods in large dimensional statistics, you can actually break the problem of nonlinearities in many of those algorithms. And that's going to be super important because in breaking the problem of nonlinearities, you're going to start to understand exactly what the algorithms are doing, how they proceed. And something extremely nice is that you're going to realize that many of those algorithms that people use or have used for, for sometimes 30 years, they tend not to do the job they were supposed to do. Sometimes they tend to be wrong and, uh, and actually to behave strikingly differently in large dimension than in small dimension. So there is some sort of a curse of dimensionality I'm going to refer to uh, that makes it that the algorithms really don't behave like you think. Uh, and so once you use random matrix theory uh, to understand what the algorithms do, you start to understand the, well, exactly what, 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 the, what are the mechanisms uh, behind 
uh, how you could uh, improve the algorithms, how you could change them, how you could make them work, and you can even compare the performances to the optimum. Sometimes if you do a bit of information theory on top of that. And so that, that starts to be extremely interesting. And so we can predict indeed that uh, starting with Gaussian mixtures, using real algorithms and, and random matrix theory, you can actually predict exactly what you're going to see. That's good. And again, that allows you to improve the algorithms, etc. But this is for synthetic data. And, and, and people in machine learning for long, so, so, so this is, uh, these are findings that we, we have started to have uh, back in uh, 2015 or something. But at the time, people from machine learning were, were, were telling us, OK, this is nice, but we don't care because real data are real data. They are not Gaussian mixtures. And, and that's true. Uh, Gaussian, large dimensional Gaussian vectors, they are not good representatives uh, for, um, for real data. But there is something extremely nice that we discovered very recently, which is that you can go beyond Gaussian mixture models using what we call concentration of measure theory. Uh, I, I will show you this that using, in addition to random matrix theory, if you use concentration of measure theory, you realize that many of the results that we have with random matrices happen to be the same, uh, exactly the same with Gaussian mixture models and with what we call concentrated random vectors. And why do we care about those? We care about those because concentrated random vectors are a very, very rich family of, of uh, uh, probabilistic models that tend to model very efficiently real data, and in particular, real images. So what I say is that if you do both concentration of measure theory and random matrix theory together, you are capable to infer the performance of those algorithms and to, to improve them, to, to find new algorithms that work for real data or actually extremely realistic data. And, 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 I, and I will show you this. It's very counterintuitive. I'm not saying that uh, Gaussian, so, so the results are going to be the same for Gaussian vectors and concentrated random vectors. So I'm not saying that Gaussian vectors are, at the end, good models for real data. But when it comes to evaluating the performance of algorithms, it's going to be exactly the same. And that's very shocking for, for uh, people used, with, uh, used to machine learning. Uh, yeah, and so that's what I want to discuss to, uh, today. So if you're not interested, that's the, the good time to leave. And otherwise, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce a bit of things about random matrix theory, just the, the basic ingredients we need to, to uh, understand in order to uh, better understand the applications uh, to machine learning, and also the intuitions. Um, okay, so let me start with the basics. I think many of you guys already know this, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you a, another maybe point of view on, on those things. Uh, so let's say you have access to a certain number of data. So here they are, uh, I'll start very easy. Uh, they are Gaussian, sorry, they are uh, random vectors, yy to yn of dimension p. p will be large, n will be large. And assume for simplicity that those data, they have zero mean, covariance uh, CP. So I, I, I had the P here because the covariance is going to scale with the dimension of the data. So let's say you want to estimate CP. Okay, So you know how to proceed. Uh, if you know that the mean is 0, uh, the classical thing you would do is estimate CP through the CP hat, which is the uh, so-called sample covariance matrix, the SCM which is just the, uh, outer, the sum of the outer products of the data times themselves. So they are centered, so I don't need to recenter them. Uh, this is a P by P dimensional matrix based on N rank one, uh, uh, sorry, rank one matrices, which I can recast as uh, being Y, Y transpose, where Y is the matrix collecting all of the data. Okay. Uh, we do this, we use this CP hat as an estimator for CP because we know it's maximum likelihood uh, when the data are Gaussian. But most importantly, we use that because uh, due to the strong law of large numbers, when the number of data goes to infinity, CP hat is a consistent estimator for CP. And so in particular, uh, the distance between CP hat and CP in any matrix norm, so in particular in spectral norm, uh, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, this is all supernatural, all, all, all is nice, but uh, we know that this is not, when I say that n needs to go to infinity, actually I should say that n goes to infinity while p is fixed, 
or actually while the ratio n over p also goes to infinity because otherwise this is no longer true and that you guys know about if you if you do a bit of random matrix theory when you assume that both the size of the data and the number of data go to infinity together in such a way that the ratio is non-trivial then the distance in operator norm uh, in spectral norm between cp hat and cp does not go to zero okay and this is the beginning of everything in random matrix theory uh, but you may you must be careful when you when you say this because let, let, let's say the covariance the, the population covariance is the identity or actually it would be true for any covariance when you look at the entries of cp hat you realize that entry wise all of the entries of cp hat do converge to the entries of cp so uh, if you set it to the identity it's very easy to do because y y transpose uh, is going to be zero everywhere off the diagonal and one on the diagonal uh, asymptotically because you're actually taking vectors with id entries that are either independent or not and so by the law of large numbers all the entries on the diagonal go to one all the entries of the diagonal go to zero but you're not converging spectral wise to the identity okay so so this is not so obvious so now, now that you guys are used with random matrix theory maybe this is something that is uh uh, simple and that you know by heart, but you must recall that behind this, there is something very unnatural, which is that all the entries of CPI, they do converge to the entries of the identity, but spectrum wise, this is not the case. Okay, We're going to see the same phenomenon arising in machine learning. And I think that's one of the reasons why people uh, tend to, to, to do stupid things or, or to use algorithms that they think behave in a certain way while they actually don't. Uh, we'll come back to this. So in particular, of course, in, uh, for us, uh, when, when PNN are decently large in, in applications, uh, in particular, when, and, and both of them are of the same order of magnitude, replacing CP hat by CP can lead to very dramatically wrong conclusions. So you don't want to do this. Uh, and when I say uh, this leads to dramatically wrong conclusions, this is already true when P is of the order of, uh, even when N is 100 times P. So the random matrix phenomena, they kick in very quick, very often, more often than we think, because even when n is 100 times p, uh, you are more into a random matrix uh, uh, configuration than the classical large n con alone configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know, so, so, the, so the, the big question, if CP hat does not converge to CP in our uh, random matrix regime, the, the question you may ask is, where does it go? And the, the, the negative answer is that it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, any two randomization, independent realizations of CP hat are going to be very different. And, and, and so it looks like a, a, a terrible, uh, bad problem uh, that we have to face in practice. But we know that a certain number of things do converge when, when N and P go to infinity. And the first thing that people have realized uh, would converge is the distribution of the eigenvalues. So I'm not... Uh, uh, showing you anything new, I suppose, here, if you assume that indeed the true population covariance matrix is the identity, and you look at the histogram of the eigenvalues of CP hat, when P and N start to increase, so here with a constant ratio, so P over N is going to be 1 over 4 every time, these are the eigenvalues when, when the matrix is of, time, of size 50, uh, these are the eigenvalues for 100, for 250, for 500, 1,000. And so asymptotically, you get this very nice limiting Martian compass tool smooth distribution that I guess uh, all of you guys already know about. Um, so indeed, this is, uh, this is what we know. I'm going to skip over this very quickly. Uh, when you take a matrix X having ID, zero mean, unit variance entries, and you uh, of size P times N, as P and N goes to inf go to infinity with a ratio C that is non-trivial, then the eigenvalues of uh, XX transpose, or what we call the empirical spectrum measure, uh, that, so that's the counting measure of the eigenvalues, then this one goes asymptotically to a limiting measure, which is the one I just showed, uh, which, uh, uh, interestingly, is, is supported, so we know exactly the distribution, and it's supported into this uh, range, and this range is not close to one, so not close to a mass of all eigenvalues being equal to one, if 
the ratio C, which is the limit over P over N, is, is not close to zero. And, and when I said that even when N is 100 times P, you are in the mat random matrix uh, uh, regime, this is because when you take one minus square root of uh, 0 0.01, so C would be one over 100, one minus square root of 0 0.01 square uh, is about 0.8, and here, 1 plus square root of c square is about 1.2. So you have a, a, a breadth of 0.4 in your eigenvalues. Okay, while well, you would expect all of them to be very close to 1. So this is why I said that the random matrix uh, regime kicks in very quickly, even when the ratio between n and p looks like it's super large. So anyways, the, those are the, 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 the typical figures of the uh, Martian copastor distribution. It gets larger and larger as the ratio p over n. Uh, increases uh, but what I wanted to and, and, and so this is the basic default setup when actually the data you observe are just noise okay all of the X's they are composed they are Gaussian vectors with zero mean and absolutely no structure in their covariance it's just identity so let's make things a bit more interesting let's assume now there is a structure and I want to estimate it so when you do uh, Principal component analysis, what you want is to retrieve the structure into the inside the covariance. So let's say that we have indeed a model like this, that your covariance is not identity, it's not just noise. It's going to be identity plus a P that is a low rank matrix. Okay, low rank in the sense that C, the covariance, is driven by two or three main uh, eigenvectors, main components, which from a principal component analysis standpoint, say that your data they are directed into this or that direction so when when you do principal component analysis you want to extract this p matrix okay uh, so what happens in that case uh, you can prove uh, that the eigenvalue distribution of my sample covariance matrix in that case when p is a low rank perturbation so it has only a few non-zero eigenvalues then the eigenvalue distribution of this is still going to be asymptotically the Martian copastor distribution. So in the sense that the vast majority of the eigenvalues are going to be found there, but at the possible exception of a few of them. And these few of them is going to be related to the rank of P of the perturbation. So in particular, if the eigenvalues of CP are all ones, but for four of them, which are equal to two, three, four, five, then what you see in CP hat, the sample covariance matrix, is that some eigenvalues here, one, two, three, four, are found outside of the support of Martian Copastor. Okay. But this is not exactly like this. In fact, it's not necessarily four, because as I increase the ratio P over N, I may see less than four. I may see actually three here in that case. I may even see only two if I keep increasing P over N. And if I keep going on like this by increasing the ratio P over N, asymptotically, you swallow, uh, you absorb all of the uh, remote eigenvalues. So from a mathematical standpoint, this is nice to see. This is uh, quite funny. Uh, but from a practical standpoint, when you do sample covariance metric, uh, sorry, when you do principal component analysis, this is going to have dramatic impact. And we will see in machine learning that this is going to be super important. Uh, why? So in terms of eigenvalues, we have this result. Uh, that's, so we have a, a variety of, of uh, versions of this, of, of this uh, theorem, but it started in 2006, uh, where indeed in the case where your population covariance is identity plus a perturbation of low rank, so let's say the perturbation is of rank K, and, and the eigenvalues of P, they are those omega 1 up to omega K, which are supposed to be all positive then we know precisely that if the mth largest population eigenvalue is greater than square root of c, so I read c being p over n, the, ratio, the asymptotic ratio p over n, then there is what we call a phase transition phenomenon that makes it that the associated mth largest eigenvalue of your sample covariance is going to indeed escape the support of Martian Copastor, it is going to converge to a value we know exactly uh, the formula of, and it's indeed beyond the one plus square root of c square, which is which I recall is the, the right edge of the Martian Copastor distribution. 
So when your energy into the mode M of your sample of your population covariance is sufficiently large, when your signal to noise ratio is sufficiently large, you're going to see an eigenvalue popping outside of the support. Or equivalently, if P over N, so the ratio C, is sufficiently small, so that means you have enough data, you're going to see an eigenvalue popping outside. So this is, this is quite natural, and this, this is what happens. And, and otherwise, if omega m is smaller than square root of c, then in that case, the, la the mth largest eigenvalue is going to be stuck into the right edge of the support. It's not going to escape. Again, this is some kind of, of, of mathematical folklore. This is nice. This is a result. OK, why not? But, but where it's going to be super important is that it has an impact on the eigenvectors. And the eigenvectors are the guys you want to retrieve, because I remind you that your objective when you have a covariant structure is to evaluate this structure. And so you want this P matrix. And in particular, you want its eigenvectors. You want its main directions. So if P is, de is decomposed spectral-wise as U omega U transpose, so P is symmetric, right? Uh, if it's a U omega U transpose with U uh, orthogonal or omission or, 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 or unitary, uh, and the eigenvectors associated on, on what I call the UIs, Okay, associated to uh, eigenvector eigenvalue omega i, then we have the same phenomenon, phase transition phenomenon that is in that case super important. That tells us, let, let's just look at the bottom, that if I take the uh, half largest or half dominant eigenvector of the pop of the sample covariance matrix, and I project it to the half largest population uh, um, eigenvector. So I want, so, so I'm estimating UI with UI hat. I want this alignment to be extremely close to one. I want the two to be uh, a perfect fit. Okay, this alignment that I want to be close to one, it happens to be exactly zero due to this indicator if omega i is less than square root of c. So when you are below the phase transition threshold, your estimate of the dominant eigenvector is going to be pure noise. It's going to be bullshit. So if you do principal component analysis under the phase transition phenomenon, what you see is nothing. You lose all the, inf all the structural information of your data. Okay, Keep that in mind. This is going to come back when we talk about application in machine learning. Uh, otherwise, if omega i goes is beyond the phase transition phenomenon, the transition threshold, then you have an asymptotic alignment that is not equal to one, that is something between zero and one, and we know exactly how to characterize. Okay, uh, is there a question? Uh, someone open his mic. Nope. Uh, so please shut down the mic if uh, you're not talking. Um, so, okay, and so obviously we see that when uh, the ratio C goes to zero, uh, this is all going to one, so that means, of course, when you have uh, more and more data, you are back into the classical regime where your sample covariance matrix is supposedly a good estimator of your population covariance, so, so you have a perfect eigenvector estimation. Or uh, uh, all the same, if omega i goes to infinity alone, uh, not, not alone, if it goes to infinity, uh, that means your single-to-noise ratio is going to increase, and so that, that makes the alignment asymptotically equal to one. Because this is supernatural. This I want you to remember. Oh, let me skip this. This I want you to remember. And, and, and this is what I call a spike model in the sense that what, what we call spike models, are, 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 in that case, we use this one. So a, a matrix XX transpose with ID, Gaussian entries, a zero mean unit variance, pre-multiplied by a covariance of the type identity plus low rank perturbation. So this is what we just studied. What I call a spike model is any type of random matrix configuration where you start from an elementary random matrix model, such as XX transpose, and you perturb it in a, in a uh, uh, low rank manner. So in the rest of the talk, I'm not going to play with this one. I'm going to play with another one, but the results are the same. I'm going to play with this one, which is some sort of an XX transpose plus low rank perturbation. And here the results are going to be the same. If I look at the eigenvectors of my matrix Y, they're going to align to some extent 
to the eigenvectors of P, provided I am beyond the phase transition. Okay? Otherwise, the alignment will be, uh, will, will be zero asymptotically. Okay, this is all I want you to remember from a theoretical standpoint. And now we can uh, get into the machine learning business. Okay, how, how are we going to use this? And so I have a few, uh, okay, this is a, uh, this is some sort of a marketing talk and uh, not, not quite a mathematical talk. So I, I have a few takeaway messages uh, in terms of what you should remember of that outside of all the mathematics. Uh, so the first takeaway message is that random matrix theory allows you to understand uh, uh, that many machine learning algorithms that people have derived and that they use on a daily basis that derived for, for, for many years and, and they use on a daily basis, they tend to collapse in large dimensions. So many of, many of the things we think are true in machine learning and that people play with on a daily basis actually turn out to be wrong when you go to large dimensions. And the problem is that today, everything is large dimensions. So uh, all those intuitions turn out to be wrong. So let me give you an example that's going to be very co connected to what uh, the, the business we are discussing since the beginning. Uh, let's talk about what we call um, uh, the problem of clustering. So clustering is when you have access to a certain number of data. Those data, they happen to belong to different classes, but we don't know that. We, have, we only observe all of the data. They turn out to be different in the sense that they belong to different classes and we want to find automatically those classes. Okay, so here I'm assuming that the data, so let's make things simple uh, to start with, they belong to a, a, a Gaussian mixture model. They are, uh, so, so the, the data X1 to XNA, they are uh, driven by a Gaussian uh, model with mean mu A and covariance CA. And this is true for uh, K, what we call classes, so we have k classes of data. My n data, they are subdivided into k classes and belonging to class A is being a Gaussian like this. But I don't know this, okay? Uh, this is my model. Let me come back to this later, possibly. What people do to, uh, one very natural approach that people use uh, very often is what we call spectral clustering. What you do, is that you compute a matrix in, in order to find who belongs to which class. You compute a matrix that I call K, uh, K because there is a kernel behind. K is of size N by N and will compare entry-wise the vector Xi to the vector Xj. Typically, what people often do is they take this affinity function kappa Xi Xj to be a certain function F of the distance between Xi and Xj. So what you do is that you, okay, you take every pair of data, you compute the distance and you take a function of the distance. And then, and then you retrieve the dominant eigenvectors of this matrix K. Why do you do this? And, and what exactly do you do? The intuition is that if I had, uh, okay, if I had sorted out my, my, my data in the correct order, Okay, let, let, let's say just for visualization purpose. Let's assume that my data are organized in the correct order. Then the idea, the fundamental idea, and that dates back to the, nine, uh, to the 90s, is that if I compare data that belong to the same class, then they are very close to one another. So from a, a, a Gaussian mixture model viewpoint, you imagine that the Gaussian is a, is a bell, uh, is a nice uh, bell-shaped uh, distribution. And so, if you all belong to one class, you are under one bell. If you are in another class, you are under another bell. So if you belong to the same class, you are close to one another. If you belong to different classes, you are far from one another. So the idea is that if you take f to be some sort of an f, uh, uh, like a monotonous function, so what people do is they take a, a decreasing function of the distance so that people in the same class, they have a strong affinity. People of different classes, they have a weak affinity. Then on the blocks of the diagonal, inside the diagonal, you compare guys in the same class. So they are close to one another, they have a strong affinity. So what you should see is very large values. However, if you compare guys that belong to different classes, so across blocks, you should see very low values. So in particular, if you take a function that makes it that uh, you are close to zero here and close to one on the diagonal, 
then the matrix K is going to be essentially of low rank. In the case where things are easy, you have ones everywhere here and zeros everywhere outside the diagonal. So when you extract the dominant eigenvectors of K, what should you see? You should see an eigenvector that looks like that, another eigenvector that looks like this, and another eigenvector that looks like that. So by looking at those three eigenvectors, so, so this is the perfect case in the, uh, in the non-ideal situation, you will see some noisy version of that. But once you have access to those eigenvectors, well, you just set a threshold and you say everyone on the left is in one class, everyone in, on the right is in another class. Okay, and so that's how people do what we call spectral clustering. Okay, very nice. Uh, but I will show you that this is not true. Very, so very nice and, and, and the very reason why the thing works, but this is not true. This is not true because let's, let's take a very simple scenario. Let's take K to be this matrix that computes the decreasing exponential. That's what people call a Gaussian kernel. Everyone uses this. Uh, so Kij is an exponential of minus the distance. And let's assume we have a, a very, very simple model that the data, they belong to, they are, belong to two classes, one of two classes. Uh, either a Gaussian with plus mu mean or a Gaussian with minus mu mean, okay? And the mean is going to be always the same. It's going to be two and a lot of zeros. Then what you observe in practice, so this is real simulation. When you observe, what you observe in practice is that indeed, when I compare data that belong to the same class, I have a strong affinity. So I see those uh, uh, yellowish uh, green color. While when I compare data from different classes, I have a weak affinity. It's, it's all blue. And so we, when I extract, so we, we clearly see that K is essentially of low rank. And then when I extract the second dominant eigenvector, so the first one is not uh, useful. When I extract V2, the second dominant eigenvector, I do see indeed that there are two classes. And I can do the, the classification. Perfect. This is exactly what people had promised. But that is for P equals four. So vectors of dimension four. Let's do the same thing now for p equals 400, which is decently large, but not uh, enormous, then in that case, the picture is dramatically different. What happens now is that when you compare data from the same class or data from different classes, you have exactly the same color. The matrix K is like all uniform. So clearly, there is no information in K. You cannot any longer retrieve the classes. It's all blue. Well, this is not true, because if I look at V2, V2 still has the information. And when you look precisely at the fluctuations inside V2, it's all the same as, as the one on the left. So you're no better, no worse in that case. So it's very strange. You have this uh, very bizarre phenomenon that makes it that all the, met all the distances are the same. This is what I'm saying. All the distances are the same, but the eigenvectors manage to see the classes still. Okay. So that disrupts fundamentally was with what people think. And the main conclusion of just this simulation says that uh, kernel spectral clustering, so the algorithm we are running here, does work, but not for the reasons we believe. It does not work because you have guys that are close and guys that are far. What happens is that in large dimension, everyone is super far or everyone is at the same distance. Okay. Uh, and this is where I come back to, uh, to here. Uh, I have to impose something else in my model. I said that the data, they belong to uh, K classes of Gaussians. Oh, I'm, I'm spitting on my screen. Um, uh, so they, they belong to K different Gaussians. But P is going to be, so something that we don't do in machine learning and that we need to do here uh, uh, in, in large dimensional statistics, uh, P being the size of the of the vectors is going to increase with, with n. So when I'm going to do my, uh, my my asymptotics, I need to control how mu and c are going to be a because mu is of size p, c is going to si of size uh, p times p. So those guys increase. So the danger in in making those those statistics move with p is that they may uh, separate too far from one another, so that asymptotically my problem becomes trivial. Or uh, uh, conversely, they may actually squash, uh, squash into one another so that my problem becomes impossible. 
So you can study this. So trust me on that. You can impose the what we call the non-trivial regime, which precisely in that case is that the distance between every statistical mean has to be big O of one in norm. If you let mu A and mu B to be more distant than one with respect to P, asymptotically the problem of classification is trivial. So I don't want this. Okay, same thing for the covariance. I want that the trace between two covariances is going to be of order square root of p. This is optimal. And that, well, okay, that, that is a long story behind this one, but essentially, the, the so this is the Frobenius norm between the two, between two covariance matrices as, as to scale uh, at, at, in the worst case as, as p. Uh, otherwise, again, things are going to be too easy to, to classify. Then, and this is where it gets weird. Under these, what I call non-trivial uh, conditions, what happens is that you can prove that. So that's not random matrix theory. This is really elementary. You can prove that under those non-trivial growth rate conditions, the distance between any pair of points, and, and I'm, when I say any pair is any guys in the same class or, or, or any guys in different classes, the distance is going to be asymptotically the same. Okay, it all goes to a value that I call tau, and this is uniform on all of the entries of the matrix. So my matrix K indeed, in my so-called non-trivial conditions, goes to a uniform color. Everyone in the matrix goes to the same limit, which is going to be, in, my, in that case, exponential of minus tau. Again, this is super counterintuitive to imagine that this that the eigenvectors of k, the eigenvectors of k are going to contain information now because all of the entries of k go to the same limit. But we know this is not a problem for us uh, random matrix theory experts because I said that at the very beginning. Remember the sample covariance matrix. It goes to the identity. All the guys on the diagonal go to one. All the guys of the diagonal go to zero. But this is not the identity. This is something much more powerful, much more structured than that. The same phenomenon arises here. K is not going to be a matrix with all constant values. It's going to be something much more structured than that. Okay. And so what we can do, so, uh, so indeed, this is, this is some sort of a curse of dimensionality. All the distances go to the same limit. What is going to be for us uh, uh, some sort of a blessing? It's going to be extremely useful because this matrix K, I didn't say this at the beginning, but look at it from a finite dimensional perspective. When you ask people, when you ask statisticians, probabilists to tell you what are going to be the, eigen, the behavior, what is going to be the, uh, uh, the behavior of the eigenvectors of K, given that K is a matrix having all those dependence between the X size in its entries and this nonlinear function applied to it. If you ask anyone to figure out what are going to be the eigenvectors, it's just impossible. It's too complicated. And that's why for 30 years, people have not managed to understand clearly what this guy was doing, what this algorithm was doing. But for us, in the large dimensional limit, the very fact that all, that all of the distance are going to converge to a certain limit will break the problem of the nonlinearity. It will allow us to do a, a stupid Taylor expansion of this exponential along the limit tau. But we have to be careful because doing a Taylor expansion entry-wise in the matrix uh, will have consequences matrix-wise. And, and, and here we have to do random matrix theory. And this is indeed what we, we, what we did. Uh, I'm coming back, back to this later. We proved a few years ago we, with my colleague uh, Florent, Florent Benayesh. Uh, many of you m must know, uh, is now making uh, uh, making money working for for finance the finance business. Uh, so you see that with random matrix theory, uh, uh, you may be uh, uh, you may become a researcher and not making money, or you may become uh, 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 you may work in companies that make money. So uh, the future the future is not so bleak for you. Uh, anyways, so um, we proved with, with Florent uh, that uh, indeed. When n and p go to infinity uh, in the in, in under the growth condition that I just mentioned, the matrix K, which is a terribly complicated object, asymptotically becomes super easy. It becomes a matrix K hat, and K hat is what? It is indeed a matrix 
which has all its entries equal to f of tau in the first order, but then hides behind a structure that is very familiar to you guys and very familiar to what I've explained from the beginning, which is a so-called spike model. What we see behind the first order is uh, something that is uh, like a bit hidden. Okay, it's, it's second order development, uh, but, but this one is not going to be a, a problem because uh, so, so this is the matrix filled with ones. It's rank one. It will live its life as an eigenvalue that goes to infinity. No problem. Uh, we don't have to think about it. But behind it, what it hides is a matrix of the type uh, ZZ transpose where Z has entries of independent entries of zero mean. So that's going to be some sort of a Martian Copas tour type matrix, a simple covariance matrix of only noise, plus a, rank one, a, a, a low rank perturbation. And this low rank perturbation does carry the information. What, did it, what, what, what is this guy? This guy is a matrix of rank K, K being the number of classes, with this matrix J on the left and on the right, J is a, is a matrix with K columns, and those columns are exactly those vectors of zeros, ones, and zeros. So when you do spectral, when you do clustering, what you want is to have access to J. So when you look at the eigenvectors of K, what you do expect is that the eigenvectors of K are going to be equal to J. Well, that's not true. What you're going to have is that since k is the sum of those two objects, you know from what I've said at the beginning of the class that the eigenvectors of j are going to be aligned to some extent to the eigenvectors of j, so to linear combinations of those things. So what you're going to see is indeed things that look like that with noise on top. And the alignment between the noisy part and the real eigenvectors you'd like to obtain or the, 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 the canonical vectors you'd like to obtain is going to be depending on how strong the signal to noise ratio of this matrix is going to be with respect to the noise. And in particular, if the signal to noise ratio is too weak and you are below the phase transition threshold, you're not going to be seeing this. You're going to be seeing pure noise. And so you're going, you're, you're going to be incapable of doing clustering. And so what does drive the performance, what does drive the signal to noise ratio is this matrix A in blue. And what is A? It's a K by K object. So it's a very small dimensional object that is fully deterministic. And that depends. I didn't give you the formula explicitly because it's ugly. But what we know is that it depends on the statistics of the data but only through three properties, the distance between the statistical means, the distance between the covariances in terms of trace, and the distance between covariances in terms of trace square. And that's it. Nothing else. The, the um, algorithm, the spectral clustering algorithm, only looks at these properties of the data in order to do clustering. And what does it do with them? It, 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 it multiplies them in a way, it, it combines them with the properties of your function f, which is your kernel, the choice of your kernel function. And people have been, for 30 years, they have been trying to figure out what is the optim optimal kernel, what is the f we should choose. No one knew because no one had an insight on the performance of the algorithm. Now we do know, and we do know that there's something super surprising, which is that the function f only interacts with the data through its derivatives, its first three derivatives in tau. Tau, I remind you, is the distance, the, 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 the converging uh, value of the distance of all the points. So the algorithm only depends, so the performance of the algorithm only depends on what happened around this value tau. And if you know how to tune this, and this is what is nice is that tau can be estimated very accurately. When you, if you can tune this, you can improve your performances. Okay, so we now know perfectly. So this is a, so all of this is a spike model. We know exactly what are going to be the phase transition phenomena. So when the the clusters, so the the the, the classes are going to be too close for us to be capable of unwrapping them, of detecting them. And, and, and also, what is the impact of your function f on this problem? 
And in fact, it gets extremely counterintuitive when you go deep into this, this analysis. Uh, okay. At this point, it's interesting to see that all of this is very nice, but again, this is on Gaussian mixture models. So when I when we presented those works with, with Florent initially to machine learning experts, they said, uh, bravo, bravo, this is nice, uh, nice work, but we don't care because this is not what happens to real data. Gaussian mixture models are not real data. And so this is where things got super surprising for us. Uh, we didn't have an argument by the time, but when we looked at what happened to real data, it appeared to be exactly the same. That is real data, so those are real images, uh, and, and those are, in, in fact, vectors, uh, representation uh, of vectors of text. When you do spectral clustering on those, when you compute the cluster, uh, the, the kernel matrix, it's all the same thing. You have the same color inside and outside the class, so sometimes it's a bit different, but not so much. And the eigenvectors do contain the information. So you have the same phenomenon, but even worse than that. And, and that really surprised us at the very beginning. What we did as the first experiment is taking real images of uh, uh, those handwritten digits. So for, for those of you guys, um, who know a bit of, of uh, machine learning. This is a very classical uh, database of uh, images written by hand that we want to, classi to, to classify. So uh, what we did is we took uh, 64 zeros like those. So uh, every vector, data vector is just the, so you take an image and you unwrap them into a large dimensional vector. So the image of size 28 by 28. So that's a vector of size 700 something. Uh, and so this is one, one, one observation. So we took 64 zeros, 64 ones, 64 twos. We computed the kernel, the kernel matrix out of them. We extracted the three dominant eigenvectors and what we observe on those images. Okay, so you see, I, I printed in color, so we don't, we clearly see the, the plateaus. So we see uh, three plateaus every time. So the third eigenvector is not so good, but the first two are cl clearly telling. Uh, and what is very surprising is that, uh, okay, so, so what, sorry, but before that, what people do is that they don't look at the eigenvectors themselves because this assumes here that you have sorted things in the right way beforehand, which is uh, cheating. You're not supposed to do this because you don't know the classes. But what you would do instead is you would take those three eigenvectors and you will uh, uh, draw them into a three-dimensional plane. So here I show you, for instance, V1 versus V2. So every point here is a coordinate here and, a co and the associate coordinate there. So now there is no ranking, there's no label. And so with those images, you can clearly uh, separate the classes. Okay, so you take your eigenvectors, you project them in three dimension, and bam, you see, you see your clusters. That's what people do. What was very surprising is that those guys, they are, of course, real images. They are nothing close to Gaussian vectors. But what you see now in blue is another experiment. It's an experiment where instead of 64 zeros, ones, and twos, we take 64 Gaussian vectors, Gaussian random vectors, having the same statistics as the zeros, ones, and twos, so the mean and the covariance. And what you see in blue is what the theorem predicts for those Gaussian vectors. And where it's super surprising, and, and even here in the three, even more here in the two dimensional representation, what you see in blue is what the algorithm would have predicted if the data had not been real data, but they had been Gaussian vectors. And what is very surprising is that you have a perfect fit. So it looks as if when you study the performance of your algorithm on Gaussian vectors, it behaves the same as it does behave on real data. So at the time, a few years ago, when we presented that, people had a hard time believing us because, of course, Gaussian vectors are not a good model for real data. I've said that already. But for some reason, it looks like in terms of performances, it's all the same. And, and people were not uh, particularly pleased with the result because it looked like the algorithm was just looking at first order statistics. And so it was not doing anything more than just comparing means and covariances. But that, that's what it does. Okay. I'll show you at the end of the talk that now we can prove this. We can prove that indeed you must have this perfect fit. 
Uh, and so this is my first takeaway message. There are uh, non-trivial things that happen in large dimensions. You guys, more than anyone, you have in your hands those keys to understand why this is normal. Why this is normal that in large dimensions, because you're familiar with random matrix theory, why this is normal that in large dimensions things behave dramatically differently. And so that in terms of machine learning, now that we understand how the algorithms behave, we have the keys to uh, help people understand better what, what, how they should uh, uh, change their intuitions, how they should change their algorithms so that they work better. And so in terms of working better, indeed, now that we know uh, we have our hands into the machine, we know how it behaves, we can uh, play with it and we can improve it. And so I will show you two examples. One uh, is very funny and very, very counterintuitive. Remember that the, 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 the theorem that I showed you is of this form. The, the K matrix is asymptotically equivalent to something here that we don't care about. This is the whole blue color uh, plus a structure and something maybe I didn't maybe I didn't show it be in the previous slide but uh, in the noise in front of the noise part you have actually a term that is f prime of tau which means that since tau is an object I can estimate again tau is the the, the distance between all of the points uh, or the distance between any pair of points since tau is known you can take kernel f such that f prime of tau is zero. If f prime of tau is zero, you have a surprising finding, which is that you kill the noise altogether. That looks super nice. The problem is that it's not so, it doesn't come for free. If you do take f of prime of tau equals zero, you indeed do kill the noise and things become asymptotically completely deterministic. But you also kill the visibility of your classes in terms of distance in, in, in their statistical means. So if you have classes with this different statistical means, but the same covariance, everything collapses. F prime of tau equals zero is the worst idea you can have. But if you have classes that have essentially the same mean, but different covariance structures, then in that case, indeed, you become deterministic. And so what you have, uh, Okay, what you have is that, let me show you for an example. If, for instance, your data happen to be two Gaussians with zero mean and different covariance matrices, then using, and, and if you make your covariance sufficiently close so that they are below the phase transition threshold, then using a, kern, a, a classical kernel, such that, such as a, a, a Gaussian kernel, such that f prime of tau is not zero, then it doesn't work. Here you see that eigenvector v1 versus eigenvector v2 does not allow for a separation of the classes. But if you take a stupid kernel of a second order polynomial such that f prime of tau equals zero, then now you move from 0% of detection to 100%. Now you see the two classes completely. And so that means that somehow I, I lied a bit when I said that I was taking my uh, non-trivial condition because now indeed uh, I, I can improve my non-trivial conditions by taking f prime of tau equals zero and this is something extremely fundamental in terms of uh, uh, all the algorithm you would do in machine learning using kernels because people don't know this they don't know that f prime of tau equals zero is a good idea as a kernel they don't know because they don't have the hands on in the machine and I will show you that it's even worse than that they don't know because it makes no sense to take f uh, f prime of tau equals zero. Why? Remember the intuition. For, forget about the top. Let, 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 let's look at the bottom remark here. The function f is a function that you apply to the distance that supposedly computes the affinity between your data points. So your idea is that when the points are close, they should have a strong affinity. But when they are in the same class, they have a strong affinity. When they are in different classes, they have a, a, a low affinity. So you want your function f to be decreasing, okay, decreasing with the distance. So f should be like this, like the exponential kernel. If you do this, and tau is a given distance here, you will never have f prime of tau equals zero. This is impossible. 
if you do take f prime of tau equals zero, you need to have a local minimum or a local maximum around tau. So you need an affinity function, which is such that if you compare guys that are close or guys that are far, they have the very same affinity. And so this is super bizarre. For people used to uh, machine learning intuitions, this makes no sense. You don't want to have guys close and guys far to have the same affinity or even worse, guys far to have a stronger affinity than guys close. But this is not a problem for us. For us, random matrix experts, we know that this is not a problem because this is not how it works. Asymptotically, no one is close, no one is far, everyone is at the same distance. We should rethink things very differently. And so it, make, it makes full sense. And so again, uh, so, so this is the very reason why no one had even thought about using this kind of a kernel. It, make really, it makes really no sense. Uh, and, and, and this is, uh, and, and again, uh, this is all on Gaussian vectors. This is all nice. And when you test on real data, it still works. So what we did is we took a uh, time series of uh, electron cephalograms because we know well, from colleagues in, working in the discipline that those time series, they are very discriminative in terms of their covariance correlation structures, not in terms of their statistical means. So if you want to detect sane versus epileptic patients from their EEG traces, you need to look at the covariance uh, structure. So we tried this, and indeed, if you use a Gaussian kernel, you can detect a bit, well, quite a bit, actually, who is sane, who is epileptic. But when you take a, a, a second order polynomial uh, with f prime of tau equals zero, you move from 70% 17, 17 of detection to almost 100%. There's a dramatic gain in performances. Uh, for those of you used to machine learning, you may know that people uh, struggle hard to win a plus 0.3% in detection. Here we are talking about 20 or, or, or 30% actually of, of improvement. This is dramatic. And this is because we, 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 we provide a new vision uh, using large mental statistics. Um, I need to skip this, or maybe I come back to this later. Um, so, yeah, just very quickly, this is an example I, I usually don't have time to present, so it's going to be the same today, I think. This is a particular example, what we call semi-supervised learning. So semi-supervised learning, let me skip everything. Semi-supervised learning is a method where you do the same thing as before. You have a lot of data. They belong to different classes. You don't know which classes. But you take the uh the time to label a few points you say okay i'll take this image of a dog i'll say it's a dog i take this image of a cat i say it's a cat and that supposedly will help the machine uh, figure out all of the other dogs and cats and i pull that hole inside the machine it turns out that in this very discipline that is very that is not very well known people know supervised learning deep networks etc people know unsupervised learning they don't know so much semi-supervised learning which essentially is what everyone does, surprisingly. And the reason I think people don't know semi-supervised learning is that, be, is that the algorithms behind, they don't work. And we know this. People have said this since ages. The algorithms that have been developed, they are super smart, very intuitive. We don't know their performances because it's too hard, but they are very intuitive. They don't work. And people have a hard time understanding what are the reasons behind. When you use random matrix theory, it, 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 it shows in, it, it uh, jumps to your face. It's obvious that it cannot work. The way it's designed for the same, very same reasons of asymptotically everyone is far, et cetera, et cetera. You can understand that the algorithm that people have derived in this discipline, they cannot work. And it's even surprising that they do work a little bit. Uh, and, and you can, and again, you can improve that. So uh, I'm not going to have time to discuss that, but for those interested, uh, you can, you can, uh, email me or you can get back into those slides. It's very impressive how stupidly bad these algorithms work and, and how people were, were, sh were, were stuck with this. So I'll just mention this in, in, a, in a book on semi-supervised learning in 2009, so this is not so far, far back in the past, uh, people said it explicitly. They are very worried about the situation where by adding more data to their algorithm, that's what they're saying, the, the performance degrades. So when you had more data, 
it degrades the performance. So when you go large dimensional, it becomes worse and worse. And that's because they don't have the large dimensional intuitions because they use a small dimensional intuition and their algorithms, which are indeed very nice in small dimension, they just cannot work in large dimensions. This is easy to see. Anyways, let me skip this. Uh, just to say that I have the PhD student working on that and we, we could understand the problem in the algorithm. We could change it, same thing as before, using a very non-obvious, very non-intuitive uh, way of uh, updating the algorithm, that, but that makes it work dramatically better. I say too many times dramatically. Uh, and I want to finish on this because, uh, no, I, I'm not going to finish on this. I have two other things to mention, uh, but I'm, I'm getting uh, more and more interested these days uh, into how to use all those things in order to reduce our, our environmental impact. Those machines, those deep learning machines, they do uh, extraordinary jobs. Indeed, you can embed that in a, in a, in a car, in, a, in an autonomous car, and, and you can drive without any problem. Uh, you can now uh, filter text on the internet and understand everything, do translation live, etc. This is uh, This is great. But in order to derive those methods, in order to build those, those, uh, uh, those deep networks, it costs a, a tremendous lot. What I learned lately is that the very last machine that has been designed to do uh, natural language processing, so, so you take text and you, you, do, um, uh, you do classification on the text, you do, uh, you do a translation, etc. The very last machine that people have invented the time it took, oh sorry, the energy in terms of carbon uh, uh, dioxide emissions that it took to build a machine is equivalent to the whole life range of three SUVs. So you take three cars, their construction, extracting the, the, the resources, constructing the car, uh, having the car run for 10 years using uh, 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 petrol for, for 10 years, and then its destruction, all of that, all of the consumption of, of, of those three cars in carbon dioxide is the same as what we use on, on servers to train those machines. This, this is just uh, not admissible. So anyways, uh, getting back to, 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 to my, so, so it, it, it's also uh, uh, something I try to convince people to work on, uh, being uh, more uh, uh, environment friendly in, what, in, in everything they do. In terms of, uh, uh, random matrix theory. This is something we can indeed improve also uh, in the sense that when you want to do clustering, again, you take this, if I take the same example as before, you have a big uh, matrix K, which is of size n by n. You have to compute its eigenvectors. This is of complexity uh, at best big O of n square. So if you have million of images, which is a million of data, which is what we have today, this is a, a million by million metrics. You cannot even run on a computer an SVD for that. So you forget about this. So, so what people will tend to do is, is, is uh, split that into many machines and, 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 and run that on, go, on big servers. You really don't want this. Okay. So uh, one possibility, if you want to reduce the cost, would be instead of looking at all of the data simultaneously, you can look at only an epsilon proportion of the data. So, so instead of a n by n metrics, you would have an n epsilon by n epsilon metrics, and you will do classification on blocks of n epsilon data. Okay, this is a good idea. Problem is that by reducing the size of the data, by reducing n, you are actually uh, 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 reducing the diversity, the, 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 the redundance, sorry, in the data, uh, and effectively reducing your ratio n over p. And, and you know that it's bad because you, you, you take the risk of being below the phase transition phenomenon. And indeed, this is something that is easy to compute. So now that I know exactly what on the performance of my matrix K when I do clustering, uh, I know what happens when I change the size of the matrix from N to N epsilon. It just changes the ratio C. And indeed, you can plot something like this, this two-dimensional plane when, where here I use the epsilon. So, so the more I go on the left, the, the more sparse my matrix, and so the more difficult a priori my, uh, not, not the more sparse, sorry, the, the, the smaller my matrix, so the more difficult 
the classification a priori and and then here i use the distance between the two classes so mu is the norm of well i have two classes with norm plus mu and minus mu so the, the norm of mu is the the distance between the classes uh, when i go to the top it becomes easy okay and so we have a phase transition phenomenon that tells us that uh, if you are in this region uh, things are possible if you are below you are below the phase transition you cannot do the classification and so in particular if I take a given uh, level of difficulty and I get uh, smaller and smaller and smaller in dimension, at some point I reach the phase transition and I, and I lose. Uh, we realized, again, using our results, that we can do much, much better than that. We can, instead of using N epsilon data, we can take all of the data, keep my million images, but I don't compute all of the entries of K. I only compute a few entries, okay, randomly, with the same epsilon as before. So, in, so before I had taken one over 50, uh, uh, I had reduced my, my, my metric size by 50. Here, I just compute one out of 50 points into the matrix K epsilon. If I look at the eigenvectors of that, it feels like I have destroyed everything. So uh, looking at the eigenvectors of that, I should not get any decent information. This is not true. In large dimensions, you keep the same structure. It turns out that the eigenvectors of K epsilon, in this, uh, this is K epsilon. If you look at the eigenvectors of K epsilon, you still have the information. Okay. And where, what becomes extremely bizarre, and here even my own large dimensional intuition is not clear about this. What appears is that in addition to this algorithm still working, you have a dramatic gain. Again, it's dramatic. Okay, you have a super big gain in 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 the range of of the uh, uh, of the uh, possible classification uh, region. So instead of being of having your phase transition here, you have your phase transition quite 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 more below. But but where I say that my intuition is very uh, uh, distorted is that if you look at what happens when you start from a given level of difficulty uh, and you go to the left so you get sparser and sparser and sparser you don't lose a single thing in terms of performances when i go to the left i don't lose anything in performance so it's as if it comes it could come for free up until a point where now i have an avalanche and indeed, when you get too sparse, you have an avalanche of big decay and doesn't work anymore. Obviously, at some point, if you remove everything, you're not going to get anything. But you can prove that. So there's another very counterintuitive phenomenon in large dimension that makes it that asymptotically, uh, it looks as if you can uh, reject the large, vast majority of your data points and not losing anything. And so in terms of performances, it's all the same. In terms of environmental impact, you have divided. So here I have the number. You have reduced your computational effort by 98%. So it's a significant gain. And so again, so this is just the example of spectral clustering. But uh, this is valid for, for a wide range of, uh, of other uh, applications in machine learning. And so it tends to think, to, I tend to believe, and this is where I'm, I'm going next in, in my, with my group, I tend to believe that using random matrix theory, so you are not going to save the planet, we're not going to save the pandas or whatever, but at least we can convince people working in this business that there's no need to go for the, always go for those crazy machines that consume like crazy, and that you can do simple things with, with powerful methods that we fully understand, you can get back using mathematics into the game. Okay? And mathematics is out of the game today in, in, in artificial intelligence. It's possible to get back into the game and to understand what happens. All the, uh, and actually the very reason why I believe we have a tail, we have, we, 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 we have an, a good argument uh is that it works for real data so i showed you an example that it looked like it worked for real data actually we can prove it works for real data and this is the last thing i want to, you to remember this is my last takeaway message and maybe this is the most optimistic one the one that says that we are all working in our cave uh doing mathematics on pen and paper and and no one 
cares about that. Your 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 parents who have always ask uh, what is there left to be discovered in mathematics? Who cares? Well, I do believe we do care because uh, it turns out that in large dimensions, things, well, large dimensional objects, they tend to behave in a very uh, consistent and very deterministic manner. We have loads of large numbers that appear on real data in large dimensions. And this is what I'm going to show you here. Uh, I'm going to be very quick on that. So essentially, the message is that everything I've said from the, since the very beginning uh, on Gaussian mixture models, it's also true on mixture models of what we call concentrated random vectors. A concentrated random vector, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, is, a, is an object. I, I guess many of you already know this. Uh, it's a vector, so let's say it's an X in RP, which is such that, and that is very, very demanding, which is such that for every Lipschitz function f, so I should say for every one Lipschitz function f, uh, the essentially the the, the 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 so sorry one Lipschitz function f that goes from R p to R, essentially the uh, function f of x is is essentially deterministic in the limit. Let, let's say it like this. So when you take if you, a, a vector x is concentrated, if when you apply a Lipschitz transformation, so what we call a, an observation, a Lipschitz observation from R p to R, the limit is deterministic. It's predictable. Okay, this is extremely demanding, and actually we don't know too many uh, data that satisfy this. And essentially, the only one we know and that that looks like a very pessimistic message. The only one we know essentially is the Gaussian random vector, or, or a vector with ID banding entries. But let's say the Gaussian random vector. The only known concentrated random vector is the Gaussian random vector. So it looks like I'm not saying anything, not saying anything useful. But there is a property. I don't know if I have it here. No, I forgot to say this. Sorry, this is the most important thing. I forgot to say this. The most important property of concentrated random vectors is that when you have one, you have many others. Because all the Lipschitz transformation from RP to RQ are going to be, because Lipschitz functions, they, 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 they are stable through, uh, through, through, uh, through composition. Uh, whenever you have a, a concentrated vector, every Lipschitz opera operation on it is still concentrated. So every Lipschitz transformation of a, Lipschitz, of a Gaussian vector is concentrated. And what I claim is that we can prove that the results I've, ex I've exposed so far, in particular this theorem we've been discussing a lot, uh, this theorem on the asymptotics of K, they, it holds identically if you replace in the hypothesis Gaussian mixture model by mixture model of concentrated random vectors. Exactly the same. Asymptotically, the performance only depends on the first order and the second order moments with the same results, etc., etc. Et so this is a classical universality result in random matrix theory. But here, it's even more universal in the sense that we use nonlinear functions everywhere and that it is still stable. And so again, why do I care about those concentrated random vectors? Why do I say it's super important? It's super important because we have examples of those guys which are which mimic very realistically real data, and this is in particular what we have in uh, what we call GANs, generative adversarial networks. So GANs, for those of you who are not so familiar with those notions, are uh, machines. So uh, uh, they, they are deep neural networks, which are trained in competition. So actually, two of them. One that has for task to create fake images, and another one that has for task to differentiate between real and fake images. What we call the discriminator is a neural network that tries to decipher, to be better and better and better in deciphering whether it sees a fake image or a real image. Okay, And the other one, the generator, has for objective to uh, make sure that the discriminator will be wrong. So they are in competition. It's a game. Okay, the, the generator may, tries to, to, to make sure the, the, the discriminator will make a, a wrong estimate. And in training those networks together, 
well, no one knows why, why it works, but, but it works. In training those networks together, the generator manages in the end to create images that are extremely photorealistic to the point that people, that human beings like you, cannot see which image is a true image, which image is a wrong image, is, is a fake image. And why do I say it's important for us? Because what you put at the input of those met, of, of those uh, neural networks is a Gaussian random vector. And what gets outside of this is a fake image. And what is in between, it's only linear connections and act activation functions that are Lipschitz operators. So it's easy to show that all of this is a Lipschitz map. Whatever, however complicated it is, it is a Lipschitz map. So those realistic images, they are just Lipschitz complicated, but, but, but Lipschitz functions of Gaussian random vectors. And so what it means is that all the results I've shown from the very beginning that do hold for real, uh, sorry, for concentrated random vectors identically as for Gaussian vectors, they do hold for extremely realistic images or extremely realistic representations of images, representations of natural language processing data. So that means that random matrix theory manages to predict the performance of, of, of on real data. And I can show you this uh, specifically on, on real images. What we did is we ran the experiment for good. We took real images of hamburgers. Uh, so, well, very close to noon, this is perfect. Hamburgers, uh, uh, mushrooms, and pizzas. We created out of them with those competitive neural networks. We created uh, those fake images. So all everything that you see on the top, you cannot eat because it's not true. It does not uh, exist. So I would not try the mushrooms. Uh, so those images, they are not real images. They don't exist. Okay, but they are extremely realistic. What we did is what we took those images. We extracted uh, what we we call feature maps, so representators re representers uh, of those images that we placed into our kernel matrix. Okay, so we really did the game of building our kernel random matrix uh, out of those GAN images and also out of those real images, and we looked at the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of of the of the data. So here, what you see for those GAN images and also for the real images, so, so the three columns are three different representers of, of the data. They are of different sizes. So the, this is a representation of the, of the images in 2,000 uh, uh, features. This is in 4,000 features, etc. So what you see is that indeed you have a very, very nice Martian Copas 2 uh, plus spike model or, or representation. Okay, this is very convenient for us. Uh, and when you look at the eigenvectors, so, so this is a fancy, so that my PhD student uh, did it very in a very fancy way. This is the, uh, 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 the, the scatter plot uh, of the classes. So here we use the three classes, mushroom, pizzas, hamburger. So what you see are the, the three classes of images uh, that are differentiated along eigenvector two and along eigenvector three. Okay, we have so many images that uh, that would have been too many points to represent. This is what you have on the top for GAN images. This is what you have on the bottom for real images. And this is, this is the real data stuff. And now in green, what I show you is the experiment ran on Gaussian vectors. So instead of using the GAN images, we now take, we create artificially Gaussian vectors which uh, have the same statistics as my mushroom pizzas, blah, blah, blah. But clearly, when you look at them, it, it does not resemble a pizza at all. It, it, it's just uh, some very bizarre image. Uh, it's just, okay, it's a Gaussian vector. It, it's, it's weird, but clearly not a pizza, clearly not a hamburger. Uh, but we take those vectors and uh, we look at the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the kernel matrix that is being created. And what you see is that it's coinciding identically, really identically in those large dimensions. So here it's 2000 times, I don't know how many images I had, uh, but quite a few. 
uh, you see that there is a strong coincidence. And what is nice is that you have a strong coincidence in GAN images, but that, has, that is not surprising. We have the theory for that now. But there is a strong uh, fit also with, for the real images. So that we should now not so much of a surprise. So real images are, are what they are. I, I cannot claim anything about them. For GAN images that resemble extremely the real images, I do, I can claim something, okay, because they are random vectors. And so there is a perfect fit. And so all of that says, again, that Gaussian random vectors are not good models for real data. But when it comes to understanding the performance of algorithm, so just a scalar, the pro probability of failure, probability of correct detection, the eigenvalues, the eigenvector distribution, all of those low dimensional statistics, they can be predicted. And, 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 and yeah, and, and using random matrix theory, uh, they can be predicted extremely accurately. So this is why I believe, so as a conclusion, that uh, random matrix theory can change the future of machine learning. And so uh, all of you guys uh, working in the discipline, I think you are in the first line to be, uh, uh, to be able to, to provide the tools because we don't have all of the tools. And here, the algorithms I, I'm treating, they are not easy, but they are not uh, uh, state of the art, let's say. So we are pushing towards getting closer and closer to the state of the art so that we can even talk to companies. We can say to people in companies, you should use random matrix theory. This is important. This is how things are going to be uh, revolutionizing the, the future of machine learning. You should invest in that. Uh, and so you guys, again, uh, you are in front line. You should defend that and, and, and keep investing in random matrix theory. Uh, and again, for the environment, this is also, uh, I think, one of the directions we should pursue. Uh, among uh, many other things, of course. And that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm uh, right on time. So, uh, oh, yeah, but I didn't leave any time for questions, though. But the, of course, if you do have questions, please, please, please do ask. Thank you very much, uh, Romain. Maybe we can, uh, so we, we are a very large attendance, but people will still be able to ask questions. We may start with the uh, questions that were asked in the chat. I hope you hear me correctly. So in the yeah. chat, there were a few questions about uh, the sample sampling. Uh, one clarification, uh, is the sample sampling random? And another question, is the no performance loss with sub sampling just an empirical observation or is it proved in theory? Uh, already forgot the first question, so that, <laughs> let me answer. Just, the is the subsampling yeah. random? Yeah. The, the, so the yeah. So oh, oh yeah yeah yeah. So this is extreme. Oh, very interesting question. Uh, yes, the subs. Uh, so when I said subsampling or or the, the 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 sparsification, what I call puncturing, I just puncture my metrics. Uh, here in this presentation, it's random, but. You can even do it, and that's even more interesting from a, a theoretical point of view, uh, as a function of the uh, quality of the correlation. So, so if you, you can do uh, otherwise, you can compute all of the entries of the matrix, but only keep those that are beyond the threshold, okay? which will sparsify a lot your matrix. It will be more costly because you have to compute all of the matrix first. But, but then afterwards, you, you would have to store only a few points. And in that case, it works even better because instead of puncturing randomly, you would puncture as a function of how good your, uh, what, what is the, the, well, the quality of your correlation essentially. So uh, yeah, if you do that uh, as a function of the value of the entry, you can even get even better, but it costs you the effort of, of doing all of the computation at once. Or you can do it together. Say you pick randomly, you estimate the value. If it's uh, below a threshold, you kick it away. You pick another one and you keep going. And that you can also uh, study. It turns out that from a random matrix point of view, from a mathematical point of view, uh, it's very, very different objects. One is just uh, taking a profile like this of, uh, let, let's say if you take a kernel of the type X transpose X, which is the stupidest kernel you can think of, and you multiply entry-wise by a profile with ID, uh, 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 Bernoulli entries, which is what I do. This is using uh, basic methods of, uh, I don't know, Gaussian tools, uh, the classical thing that we would do in random matrix theory. So this is kind of easy, let's say. 
uh, and the result is fun, by the way. Uh, you see that uh, the Bernoulli matrix will give rise to a semicircle distribution. X transpose X will give rise to a Martian co-pastor law. When you do the Adama product between the two, it turns out that you have a, some, some sort of a mixture of uh, limiting. But anyway, see, again, this is mathematical folklore. Um, what was I saying? Yes. And when you when instead you decide to keep the points or not, depending on their values, now you use a kernel. So you need to apply a certain function sigma onto the entries of your kernel. And that is a very different story. And that uses very fundamentally different tools, uh, in particular orthogonal uh, polynomial approaches. And uh, yes, and, and there was another question. No, it was the same. The other question uh, was, is the no performance loss with uh, subsampling just an empirical? So what is the theoretical status? Uh, okay. Yeah, so I cheated a bit uh, in order to uh, to, to give, uh, uh, I mean, like uh, the, 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 uh, the, shiny, the shiny picture. So the shiny picture is indeed that you are very, very stable here. This is indeed, you can prove it. We, we have the curve, so we have the theory. For this curve this is not empirical uh, it is true when n over p is kind of large uh, as you would re reduce the ratio n over p you would have something that goes more like the, the red one but uh, if you use this method of choosing deterministic uh, sorry uh, choosing selectively the entries of the matrix k by by with this thresholding approach you will get even more below and it will get even longer here before it drops and maybe even more interestingly, when you get too sparse, you fall into a regime where random matrix theory collapses because you are getting sparse. And sparse for random matrix theory is a problem. Uh, and in that case, you move back to another world where only statistical physics can, can have an answer. And so I have a PhD student working in statistical physics and who knows that we should not use the matrix K in that case. When you get too sparse, Forget about K, you should use more elaborate methods. So for those of you familiar with uh, uh, clustering on graphs, community detection on graphs, people talk about the, the non-backtracking operator, the beta Hessian matrix. If, you, if those things ring a bell, those are the objects you should use in that case. And then the performances will also improve, but only in the sparse case. When you get dense, the two methods are essentially the same. And, and but, but we don't have the mathematical tools to understand this, unfortunately, so far. Only the statistical physicists uh, can help us. Other questions? I, I have one question. You, you, you showed several instances of universality where um, models yes. with Gaussian vectors behave similarly as, as the real data. Uh, but if we wanted to, to rigorously prove instances of this mathematically, what is the class of distribution that we should consider for modeling the real data besides the concentrated random vectors that you already mentioned? Yeah, so as you understood, the reason why, so, the, okay, it was, it, it turned out that it was a bit by chance that we fell onto the concentrated random vectors because I had a PhD student uh, who wanted to, well, that we figured that using concentration of measure theory, it was so nicely knitted with the, 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 the tools we use in random matrix theory, playing with the resolvents, etc., It was so natural that it was more convenient, according to him, to work with concentrated random vectors. They were more general, more uh, easy to handle than uh, using the independence into the vectors. And then only we figured that uh, concentrated random vectors, they are much, much more rich than we thought and that they can represent real images they can, they, they can be used to model real, real images. They can be used to model uh, 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 text, so to create artificial text, because this is what uh, um, uh, deep learning methods do, and this is how they do it. So how, away from just knowing that this is, uh, we have examples of machines that create artificially uh, uh, those concentrated random vectors, we, we don't have a theoretical proof. But there is an intuition behind, which is that when you use a concentrated random vector, you start from a vector of independence entry, so with many, many degrees of freedom, and you transform it in a way 
that does not reduce the degrees of freedom. The Lipschitz property makes it that you don't have energy evading. If you would use uh, non-Lipschitz functions, you can evade, you can concentrate everything, to, uh, not concentrate, uh, you can evade the energy into a specific, uh, well, you can reduce the, the number of degrees of freedom and that will kill your universality phenomenon. So the, the very reason I think why concentrated random vectors are so flexible is because they keep somehow the degrees of freedom while creating possibly extremely complex correlation structure in the data. So, uh, so to answer your question, so I did not answer the question. The, the question was what, what, what type of, a, of an object should I take as a very, very generic model of data that would be very realistic? I would say you need to maintain the number of degrees of freedom inside your vectors because you, we know that when the vectors are get sparse, everything collapses. You don't have the concentration, you don't have any convergence sometimes any longer. You need a lot of degrees of freedom. So this vision of you start from a vector with a lot of degrees of freedom, you Lipschitz transform it. This is this works. If you have another way. Of, of having a lot of degrees of freedom while being extremely contracted with, with many uh, strong complicated dependence, this will, I believe, still work in a way. Uh, yeah. And, and, and by the way, this is, I think, well, and, and people tend to believe that too, this is, I think, why deep networks, they do work, while small dimensional uh, uh, neural networks that didn't work in the past, they were very unstable. And if, if you would initialize them at different points, they would get different conclusion. You would have sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. It was super unstable. And I think it is stable now because you have so many degrees of freedom in the data, but also in the network itself when you initialize it. And, and well, this has been proved by, by changing those, 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 those neural networks into uh, simpler models of... Uh, um, uh, how do you call that? Uh, uh, Gaussian random fields. This has been true for Gaussian random fields, but we do believe it's true also for Gaussian. Uh, sorry, for, for neural deep neural networks. So this stability that makes it that we understand what happens in large dimensions, it's really really due to the many many degrees of freedom that average out into uh, well law of large numbers. It all boils down to law of large numbers. You need a lot of degrees of freedom. Uh, yeah. So it's not a concrete answer. But it's guidelines, I think. Uh, if you, <laughs> I, I would stick to concentrate random vectors for a while. Thank you. Are there other questions? Um, well, I think people are tired and, and ha hungry. <laughs> Yeah, Christelle, uh, on, uh, on t'entend pas. Uh, you don't have your mic on. Uh, still not. Uh, okay. Guillaume, tu peux voir peut-être si le micro de Christelle est bloqué. <laughs> Sinon, on peut prendre ça offline. Hein, si tu... Tu, on, on, tu peux m'envoyer un email. Ah, en principe, non. le micro, devrait, euh, le, le micro de, de Christelle Morisseau devrait fonctionner maintenant, mais je n'entends pas. Non, non plus. Ah, uh, the, the question is in the chat. So the, the question of Christelle Morisot is, what about SVM? Oh, yeah, yeah, we, oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's also another interesting point. So everything I mentioned in, in this uh, um, course here is uh, dealing with uh, algorithms for, that are uh, directly related to the, to, the, to the random matrix object we're studying. And so in particular, when you do SVMs, this is going to be another story because you have an optimization framework behind. Okay. And, and here it gets interesting. So we can do, so the, the quick answer is that yes, we can study the performance of SVMs. We have phase transition phenomena, we have everything. And it, it's very interesting from a, a random metric or mathematical standpoint because 
SVM is not the solution to SVM is not an explicit function of your uh, kernel matrix. If you do a kernel SVM, uh, it is an implicit function in the sense that you have to optimize, uh, uh, you have to minimize a, a, a convex function. And so what we do, uh, we, we were not the first to study this, but the people that had done that before us. Uh, what you do is you look at the solution uh, gradient of, of your of your cost function equals zero. This is an implicit solution as a function of your kernel matrix or of your random objects, and that you can solve. So with perturbation approaches, uh, you manage to and that creates also another uh, higher degree of uh, dependence because you have a functional of the type f of k equals zero. This is what you need to solve. Uh, and, and, and clearly it creates another higher level of dependence that you can break asymptotically again. And so we know what on the asymptotic performance of SVM, we know uh, that indeed uh, there is a, a, a also a transition threshold. We can optimize the, the kernel you would use to make SVM work better, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many works around that, indeed. But many things, logistic regression, uh, um, well, m many classical objects uh, let's say everything standard in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in machine learning can be studied using random matrix theory, but when it comes to uh, deep neural networks, deep neural networks are really too complicated. So far, we, we, we don't manage to, 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 to have a, a theoretical grasp on it. Okay. And all the methods that will create structural dependence like uh, Time dependence, uh, uh, dynamics, uh, Markovian structures, etc. That becomes a nightmare because this dependence is hard to 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 break. Um, but aside from that, uh, like KNN uh, uh, networks, also on like K nearest neighbors are, are, are a bit of a problem because they create strong dependence that we don't know how to break today. But we also know they don't work in large dimensions, so it doesn't really matter. It's not worth the effort. But there yeah. Yeah, sure, Sorry, sure. There was a further question uh, from Christelle Morisot. Could it be a way to find primarily the good samples for sparse K? Ah, yeah, that, 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 yeah, that's exactly one of the problems. Good samples means selection and means uh, you, you will create correlation. And so if you would say, I start with like a, a basic set of samples and I need to know which are the next ones I need to add uh, in order to improve my algorithm. Uh, that creates a strong dependent structure in between the data, and that makes it that my matrix, well, let's say my, my matrix XX transpose here is going to have columns that are so correlated by your, your uh, deterministic choice of appending the data one after the other that all the classical results in random matrix theory, they will collapse. I don't know if anyone is, is studying this, uh, like those, those selection methods where you built up a matrix based on a selection of columns that depend on a, on a given criterion that depends on the previous vectors. Like, so some sort of a time series, but pretty complicated to targeting a goal, which is uh, improving the performance of this or that metric. Uh, I, I'm not so aware of uh, who would be doing this. I know people that study time series, but but not like this, not with those structural dependence. I think it's hard. Okay, I think it's hard. So uh, yeah, this is a strong limitation. But I would love to to yeah to see any development in this direction because this is clearly something people do in machine learning. They don't want to well, they want to select the data, the next data that come in. Okay, maybe we will stop uh, here in order yeah, to yeah. have lunch. Um, but uh, thank you very much.